So today, what I want to do is try and keep it somewhat relaxed. I have a little bit of an interactive activity to get our minds thinking about voice. Um, but I also want to join you, ask you to join me, sorry, in really trying to step back. One of the things Joan used to always say is, maybe we can try and make things strange. Maybe we can think about how did we come to think about voice in the ways that we do. And ask ourselves, do these understandings contribute to social practices that devalue or exclude some persons? What moral implications are evoked? For example, what are the implications if we fail to recognize the communicative potential of all persons? How do normative understandings of voice mediate our research results and impact? Specifically, can researchers give voice to participants? These are a few of the questions that I put in the abstract. And we won't be going on in depth, but I think, again, you might want to listen today, and particularly in an activity, think about your own ideas about what makes a good interview. Who is the ideal subject? Again, how do normative understandings mediate our research results and practice? And again, I want to emphasize this notion of let's think about this thing about giving voice to participants, what that means and what sorts of implications it has. So the talk I'm giving you today draws on my doctoral work and my postdoctoral work where I've had a chance to extend this work, but also my clinical background as an occupational therapist, where for many years I worked with young people who had little or no speech because of various neurological differences, for example, like autism or cerebral palsy. They communicated using a combination of gestures, eye gaze, facial expressions, communication symbols, speech generating technologies, and frequently familiar communication partners. Very much like some of the pictures that you can see here. Um, this combination of ways of communicating is often termed augmentative and alternative communication. Or you'll hear me today say the phrase AAC. It's just an acronym for that, for that longer term. And I also want to just point out the images here are not my research participants, but these are images available publicly in the domain. So in my doctoral study, I examined links between dominant calls for social inclusion and the everyday lives and practices of 13 high school aged youth who use AAC. But today, and because our CQ seminars focus on methodology, I'm not going to be speaking to you about the results. In brief, my research demonstrated that some forms of so-called inclusion actually reproduced the exclusionary systems and structures they were intended to replace. And the youth reported that their inability to communicate using speech was a key factor that contributed to stigmatization and negative social relations. Precisely because youth in the study communicated differently, it was necessary for me to theorize what has been termed communication impairment. So today in my talk, I wanted to spend some time with you first problematizing dominant conceptualizations of voice. And after troubling the way that voice is tacitly understood, I want to outline a more dialogical conceptualization of voice that I developed through my work. Until quite recently, the experiences and perspectives of youth who use AAC were absent from childhood disability research. And the reasons for this were really twofold. First, researchers assumed that youth who use AAC would not be capable of speaking for themselves. But also researchers lacked access to well-described methods to guide them in designing interview studies and generating participant data with this population. In the last decade or so, there has been an increase in knowledge and awareness of methods for involving people who use AAC in research as respondents. And there is a small body of work that examines substantive issues with youth who use AAC. However, just a couple of the images here are indicative of the few results that there have been, which indicate that these young people live very, very marginalized, excluded lives revolving primarily around their family and the bottom slide, I know you can't necessarily read this text, but it alludes to a, a, um, 
kind of a program that I've been following. This is a UK program at the bottom. It's called Our Secret Lives, helping us reveal our secret lives. So the sense that people really don't know about these young people, about their lives, but we do know that they really encounter a lot of difficulties, um, feeling as though they are a part of the worlds that they interact within. There's also still relatively little information on strategies and procedures for generating rich accounts with this group, and even less that tells us about methodological approaches for interpreting data that has been generated with participants who communicate primarily in ways other than speech. After all, most of us have come to think of oral speech as natural, so that speech differences become identified as pathologies to be corrected. However, based on his work with people who had neurological conditions, who used alternative modes of communication, Oliver Sacks observed the following. It's all too easy to take language, one's own language, for granted. One may need to encounter another language, or rather, another mode of language in order to be astonished, to be pushed into wonder again. So I would like to push us today into wondering about the ways we think about notions of voice. I will suggest that thinking about how disability, communication impairment and voice necessarily opens a space where we can reflexively reconsider normative assumptions about how voice is constituted, where it is located, whose perspectives matter, and whether any one of us, child or adult, possesses our own authentic voice. In order to get us down this path, and as Sachs said, encountering a different mode of language, I want to very briefly ask you to indulge me in a bit of an activity. So you'll find in front, well, not, not quite yet in front of you, <laughs> um, a couple of people have some handouts I'd like you to just have one of those between either two or three people. It doesn't matter if you prefer or the way you're sitting. If you're in a group of three, that's fine. One of you, just for a few minutes, is going to play the part of someone who doesn't have speech. So you're not going to be able to speak. One of you will take on the role of a researcher. And if you have an observer, even better. If you have a third person, then you can have that person be an observer. So what I'd like you to do, once you have the handout, this is a basic alphabet communication display, somewhat like some people might use. But remember I said that usually people who have little speech do have many, many other ways that they communicate as well. So you might want to be thinking about, aside from using this display, what are all the other ways that this person in front of you is communicating? What other signals or gestures or expressions are helping you? have a sense of what's going on. So just for about five minutes, whoever is the person who is using the display, so the person who has little or no speech, will respond. Whoever plays the role of researcher can ask, tell me a bit about yourself, or, and if you have time, and, what is your area of research? So give it a go, and while you're doing that, because I know you're all brilliant and you can multitask, <laughs> I want you to just have in the back of your mind, again, some of these questions about how we think about voice. How is meaning constructed in the exchange that we call dialogue? And we'll come back together in five minutes. So it was a bit slower. Very. It was work for both partners. Very. Took a little bit of concentration. But I hope it also pointed out there is a material element when you start using this. It makes part of the communication material. It brings this display into yeah. the communication, but also previous understandings that you both share about what do you do with a letter board, or how do you spell, or perhaps thinking ahead about where that person's going and completing their word. Anybody else? Any quick comments? We don't need to belabor this or spend a lot of time, but any burning comments? Yes. she could almost like your phone anticipate what the word is going to be she was like jumping ahead and like answering the sentence so um and also at one point i pointed to something like let's take a break as kind of a joke and um you know after the first question and just the ability to put some humor into it 
was nice. That was kind of like softened what was going on. It was very exhausting though. I started doing it. I was like, but I wouldn't care for the humor because I know Paula. Ah, okay. If I would not know her, I would not. I would be like not sure what. To yeah, get you her. might have had to say, "Oh, are you tired? Do you yes. need?" A, yeah. So anyway, we're going to cut it short there. Um, I know that lots of times people don't enjoy interactive activities, but I really wanted you to get this sense to start thinking, even in a very concrete way, about what we call communication, how that relates to this notion of voice, but also this idea about how we construct meaning in a dialogue. And while this example really relates to people who have communication difference, I hope that maybe also later, I'm trying to plant a little seed today and let you have that percolate or grow into thinking about, well, how does that apply, if at all, in my research or in other kinds of dialogues and conversations that don't have to do with communication difference, but might have to do with other types of difference, perhaps a power differential, perhaps a relationship of a child and an adult, but other sorts of situations where you can think again about, well, how could I break that apart? think about like what's going on here okay so moving on I want to then get a little bit more specific about what I said was this problem problematization of the ways we think about voice so to begin I really want to together consider how voice as a concept is socially constructed as an individual possession an autonomous expression of one's inner self, an independently produced utterance. By this, I mean we tacitly understand voice as something located within individuals. We imagine speech as a product of independent thoughts that are unique and our own. Thus, speech and the views expressed through speech are attributed to the person, the individual speaker, and accordingly, the value of any particular utterance is dependent on the social value attributed to the speaker by their audience. This relation between the value of an utterance and the value attributed to the speaker has profound implications for people with communication impairments. People with communication impairments, or sometimes called speech pathologies, have been constructed in biomedical discourses as incapable inexperienced, dependent, and vulnerable. And as a result, those who communicate primarily in ways other than speech are tacitly deemed less credible, valid, or valuable, and have been systematically excluded from most research because of these assumptions. Left unexamined, these assumptions contribute to all kinds of concerns. For example, since most communication devices are pre-programmed by a person other than the user, Queries have been raised regarding the authenticity of responses generated using the device. These researchers wondered whose voice was being produced. Were people who used these devices being lent voices? And can a researcher ethically speak about or for participants who communicate differently by interpreting their nonverbal gestures, facial expressions, or non-speech utterances? Can voices deemed inarticulate meet conventional standards of so-called authenticity? Researchers have cited concerns about instances where, during an interview with a young person who used AAC, a parent, being more familiar with their child's particular manner of communicating, would interject to clarify or expand on the child's responses. But based on the types of assumptions I've just outlined about a person's own voice, these contributions from familiar communication partners were deemed invalid and eliminated from the data within those studies. So queries about whose voice is being elicited really reveal assumptions about voice as a personal attribute or property that, that can be possessed as dominant but really problematic. They expose broader, pervasive, and often unacknowledged assumptions about who is able to articulate their views on issues that matter, as well as what types of speech and which ways of communicating are listened to, which command attention. Particularly in contexts such as research, education, law, and healthcare, where professional views tend to dominate. I would suggest that in the context of children and communication difference, 
these issues become, we could call, amplified. Because of the virtue of additional assumptions about children's competencies to weigh in on issues that matter to them. You'll see I'm suggesting the biomedical child is also deemed as incapable, inexperienced, dependent, vulnerable, and in need of protection. So while I certainly feel that eliciting the views of disabled children is a critical agenda that demands our attention, I do wonder whether one limitation to meeting this goal is the focus on identifying conditions under which children can express their own views. The assumption that children or persons who communicate in ways other than speech require special conditions to elicit some inner voice that's wholly unique and independent really has the effect of obscuring the interdependence and relationality of all our talk. Today I want to argue that their views are no more infused with views of other people, family members, friends, teachers, or healthcare professionals, than are the views of so-called normal people who communicate using speech. However, this group, oh sorry, and this group are seldom required to prove, you and I are seldom required to prove the authenticity, independence, or validity of our expressed wishes, preferences, and concerns. So having set out at least some of the ways that communication or persons with communication differences tend to be overlooked or discounted, I want to shift now to discuss how Bakhtin's dialogism counters individualized constructions of voice and opens a way for us to think differently. Mikhail Bakhtin was a Russian philosopher and linguist who promoted conceptions of communication and voice as dialogical. His writings illustrate the ways that some persons' voices and some forms of speech have come to be privileged, unquestioned and authoritative, while others are deemed less valuable, indecipherable, unreliable, or uninformed. His aim was to reveal the relational and situated nature of all dialogue. Based on my readings of Bakhtin, I synthesized two key propositions that run through Bakhtin's dialogism and provide a lens for thinking differently about what is termed communication impairment. I want to start with the first. Bakhtin argued that taken for granted assumptions about the individual autonomous speaker are illusions. Instead, he asserted that voice is located in the space between, or the interface between persons. Thus, his theorizing relocates voice from within an idealized autonomous individual to the in-between spaces between speakers where meaning is actualized. He insisted that utterances include more than the spoken word, a raised eyebrow, a pointing finger, a grimace, all are utterances <coughs> with communicative potential. Furthermore, this in-between space contains more than just the utterances of a child and parent or a researcher and participant it also encompasses utterances that have gone before and those that are anticipated. And as Bakhtin reminds us, our speech is filled with others' words, varying degrees of otherness or varying degrees of our ownness, varying degrees of awareness and detachment. These words of others carry with them their own expression, their own evaluative tones, which we assimilate, rework, and re-accentuate. This first proposition provides a way to problematize dominant understandings of voice which attribute talk to individual bodies that produce autonomous utterances in response to another speaker. Sociologist Arthur Frank has written about the merits of adopting a dialogical approach when interpreting research participants' accounts. With Bakhtin, he argues, no one person's voice is ever even his or her own. Each voice is always permeated with the voices of others. In other words, all utterances are multi-voiced in the sense that they're inextricably linked to what has been said before and anticipate what will be said next. Accordingly, we are all limited and enabled in our talk by what has already been said, by the language we have available and by our anticipation of what will and should 
be set next. In one example, in research that involved young children, some of whom had communication impairments, Kwame Lainan critiqued understandings of children's voice as a relatively straightforward mental, verbal, and rational property of the individual. With Bakhtin, she argued, voice is always a multidimensional social construction and that determinations of what is true and real are always, therefore, unresolvable. She described discourses on communication as essentially moral, since the notion of giving voice presumes a pre-existing voice or utterance that has been subjugated or muted and must be brought into line with norms of good or coherent communication modes. A dialogical view, in contrast, posits that voice only exists in the relation between two or more communicators in the context of connection and dialogue. Thus, voice is not an individual property. Persons with autism do not have their own voice that can be retrieved any more than do other persons. But of course, they do have views that are formed over time and in the context of social relations. Their expression of these views is a reflection of those social relations, but arguably no more or less than for any of us here today. People with communication impairments, indeed most disabled people, are positioned according to their differences. They are called on to prove the authenticity of their voice and reclaim agency that is denied them by virtue of communicating differently. Likewise, when they're assumed to be incapable, their agency is undermined and they're required to prove that they are able to understand and express views about what matters to them. A dialogical approach insists that all communication is interdependent and mediated co-production between persons. This means that voice is only ever actualized in a game, that space connecting persons. It's produced through utterances and dialogue, through listening, watching and responding, through contextualizing what is being communicated in relation to what has been said before. Moreover, giving voice presumes a pre-existing voice or utterance again, as I said, that has been muted, whereas a dialogical view really stresses this positioning, this relocation of voice between two speakers in the context of talk. Thus, voice is not in any way an individual property that researchers can retrieve, enable, or possess through interviews. This leads us directly to Bakhtin's second proposition, that meaning is actualized through dialogue. Bakhtin pointed out that meaning is dynamic, relational, and always uncertain. From this perspective, communication is a dialogic struggle, and out of this struggle, identities are shaped. Here, struggles are over meanings. Whose meanings count? How meanings are ascribed value? how meanings can change, and how life is made meaningful through relationships. In my work, struggle certainly seems a fitting term to describe the work of youth who use AAC and their families as they struggle against dominant stereotypes that assume that they have little to say. And in the hierarchy of forms of talk, they are too often judged incoherent, unintelligible, and even simple. Bakhtin, however, insisted further that verbal communication is not self-sufficient. Rather, verbal discourse directly engages an event in life and merges with that event, forming an indissoluble unity. Meaning is constructed within the unity of the real conditions of life that generate a community of value judgments, the speakers belonging to the same family, profession, class, or other social group, for example. Thus, for example, while a child using AAC might have limited words to express particularly complex ideas, they may well have views on the issue and the capability to convey their meaning if we attend to all of the other ways they are communicating and if we attend to the context of any given situation and how that has produced situated meanings. Bakhtin stressed the importance of gestures and facial expressions which he described as extraverbal context that's shared 
by the speakers almost like passwords that are known only to those who belong in the same social space. This would be a bit like the comment Denise had about this group knew each other very well and almost had those passwords that were what has been said before combined with context. This is especially helpful as we think about the passwords that can develop between family members or close friends, where a glance or a single word expressed in a particular tone can convey meanings that are largely invisible to an unfamiliar people. So this dialogical view of meaning has implications for how we listen to persons who communicate differently, especially in the context of biomedical discourses that pathologize difference and privilege positivist notions of singular truths that capture some pre-existing knowable position, perspective, or account. Following Frank, a more ethical relation is one that seeks to understand all persons' narratives as one move in a continuing dialogue through which those persons will continue to form themselves as they continue to become who they might yet be. In this way, whether through speech, nonverbal expressions, assistive technologies, or perhaps simple eye gestures, we come together and through connections and dialogue, we are all continually changed. So, how to make sense of all of this? And what does it mean in relation to qualitative inquiry and interviews more broadly? Baptiste suggests to be means to communicate. A person has no sovereign territory. He is wholly and always on the boundary. Looking inside himself, he looks into the eyes of another or with the eyes of another. In my research, one young participant expressed almost exactly this thought when she said that her favorite thing was to sit on the lounge chair at the end of the day and she could look into the eyes of her mother and they simply knew what they were trying to communicate. So while I am not advocating that there's one right way of conceptualizing voice, I am advocating that we shift away from notions of a person's capacity to express their own singular voice. Again, really to emphasize the assumption that children require special conditions in order to elicit an inner voice that's wholly unique and independent really has the effect of obscuring the interdependency and relationality of our work, of their talk, sorry. So what are the implications of this way of thinking about voice? First, I would suggest that in my work specifically, interviews with youth who use AAC, as with all persons, occur within situated, shared, interdependent dialogues where the contributions of each speaker are sought. I would advocate for increased acknowledgement of the moral agency of groups identified as vulnerable or so-called hard to interview, such as children or persons who communicate differently, and their wealth of relevant experience. The work or this way of thinking about voice really helps it implies for us that we need to think about how all meanings are uncertain. So therefore, meaning that have been formed in dialogues with persons who communicate in ways other than speech are no more uncertain, no less valid or valuable than those formed through dialogue with putatively capable, normal people. And finally, as we consider broader conceptualizations of communication, I suggest we need to find ways to transcend the capable, incapable binary that acts to discount, mute, or silence some persons. These binary ways of thinking perpetuate moral hierarchies, judgments, and beliefs about whose voices matter. So where have I gone next with this way of thinking? I just want to briefly share a few of the projects where I've had an opportunity to extend my thinking along these lines. Um, to begin, I know you can't read these, but if you're more interested in this work, there, are, there is one key paper that essentially says what I've been saying today in, in more detail, as well as a second paper that follow-ups to describe how I used the critical dialogical methodology and combined it with methods in my doctoral work. As I said, I've been really privileged in my postdoc to work with a group who um, have very keen interest in these issues 
the acronym for the team I work with actually, it is VOICE. However, it stands for Views on Interdisciplinary Childhood Ethics. Still wrapped up within the mission of that research team is this notion of really promoting recognition of children's agency and their ability to, to weigh in on what matters to them. So one of the first papers we've put out together is a piece that's looking at a relational ethics framework, forwarding ways to try to break down this binary of having to listen to just the parent or just the child in the context of healthcare discussions. Again, I know you can't read these, but we have a couple more papers in development I wanted to just talk about because they begin to take on some of the tricky issues like what about the group of people identified as having intellectual delay or I mean, there are many different names people might throw out, um, but people who are cognitive impairment is another. What about the views of this group and, and the ideas about whether they have views they can express, that we need to value, ways that they can participate in putting forward what matters to them. And I particularly love this quote, regardless of legal debates, lack of competence does not remove the right to express a view. Um, I've also had the privilege of trying to bring these ideas into conversation with some of the key issues in children's pediatric palliative care, where again there's an, an intersection of multiple issues about vulnerability, needing to protect, needing to silence, what can be discussed, what can the child discuss. Um, so it's been very interesting to look at again a more relational, more dialogical view on how we might really attend to and recognize children's perspectives in the context of pediatric palliative care. I've also been able to bring this work into looking at ways, a very, very interesting new technology called BioMusic, which um, was being used, uh, well, it was actually an exploratory session that was part of a Shirt Connections meeting. And we were looking at how this notion of BioMusic has been constructed and what are its meanings? Is it a communication? Is it something else? And so for me, I was able to look at this notion of technologies, persons, communication as a bit of an assemblage and talk about, again, these notions of how we think about voice as either an inner possession, um, something that can be possessed, or how we instead look at as uh, these ways of like dialogical communication as a series of connections that can be coming together, broken apart, and so on in ways that either are enabling or disabling. Um, and currently I'm working on a project that I was invited into where, again, we're trying to bring forward the views of child stakeholders in relation to a project that is examining human rights and disabled children. I'm working on launching a project at Holland Bloorview here in Toronto where um, what we want to do is examine how young people have been involved in governance activities. So this is related to the larger movement of patient engagement, but we specifically want to understand better how they are feeling about how their views are being brought forward, what kind of weight is attached to those, is their um, input consequential, um, so talking to different stakeholders in a bit of a case study. Um, we also are talking, working with Brenda on something where we're trying to bring forward a group of people interested in talking about constructions of children's voice, specifically within qualitative inquiry. So we're going to look at eventually building perhaps um, a shirk um, proposal that would help to fund some work in that area. And I wanted to leave it here, but just repeat a few of these questions to lead us into discussion. So I know this is repetitive, but here I want you to think a bit about your own work in our discussion. You have probably other questions, but just to get us going, again, how is voice conceptualized in your area of research, if that's relevant? How do normative understandings of voice mediate research results and impact in the areas that you work? And clearly, if you're interested, we could discuss, can researchers give voice to participants? Thank you very, very much.